his heart. He's a baby. But he has matured. He's become a spiritual man. Now, when a, when a person leaves the first chair and they, and they go to the, the infantile chair, you're going to go one of two directions. Nobody stays in this chair. It's a short-lived chair. You either grow or you slide back. You go backwards. And, and you become a carnal person. A carnal person is someone who's received Christ, but, but they're missing out on all the benefits of the Spirit of God. It's kind of like a person who says, I know Jesus, but they live like the person in this chair. Trying to be in both at the same time. This person who is a, a carnal person loses all the joy of being a Christian. Which brings me to my topic today. Joy. Joy. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy. In fact, he says that, it says that in, in, verse, in Galatians 5.22. But the question is, joy. What is it? What is it? I first want to define it by what it is not. You see, it's more than what the person in this first chair has. The person in the first chair has and seeks happiness. They want to be happy. Uh, that's all they want. Just, just, just make me happy. Happiness. You ever notice that the word the word happy is the same as the word happens? It's the same thing. When something happens favorably, and when circumstances in my life are positive, everything's going my way. I have an emotional pleasure based on that happenstance. All right. My happiness can be something that's just as simple as, hey, my boss tells me I'm going to get a raise. Oh, my, my happiness. <laughs> this is wonderful, right? But he said, but with the raise, you're going to have to move to Alaska. <laughs> All of a sudden, the happiness, whoo, wait, I wouldn't have planned on moving. I just bought a house here. You see what I'm saying? Happiness always depends on what happens. Circumstances. And when circumstances don't go my way, I get very unhappy. I, I get angry. I get resentful. I get mean-spirited. I get bitter. I have anything but happiness because things didn't go my way. You know what I'm talking about? Of course you know what I'm talking about. Now, joy is not happiness. Joy is something quite different. It is happiness on steroids. That's what you got here. Happiness on steroids. I don't know how else to find this out. It's the emotional pleasure that you get independent of what happens like this. That's because I have a joy in the Lord. So that no matter what happens on this level, I don't get it. Whatever happens on this level, I have joy in the Lord because it's not dependent upon this stuff because I've already got the emptiness filled inside with God who is eternal. He fills up that God-sized vacuum. I, my life is overflowing. That's what I have over here. And so the, the Christian who is a mature Christian, but the struggling Christian, you see, the guy that should have been growing this direction has gone this direction, he's got... He's looking to find fulfillment this way. So what does he do? It's the Christian who thinks that I'm going to be happier if I have more vacation time. Uh, if I have a, a, a nicer car. If I have a bigger home. If I have more friends. And you just go down the whole list. Well, whatever. It, 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 more, more, more. And every time a person says, you know, I got all this stuff. But I'm not because they don't have the joy. They went the wrong direction. Instead of moving this way, move this way. They abandoned the source of what's going to give them ultimate, ultimate joy in life. Joy. Where does it come from? Oh, I kind of answered that. The Bible says in several places, it's joy in the Spirit. Joy given by the Holy Spirit. Then it says, it is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. When you've accepted Christ, you got all the Holy Spirit you're ever going to get. Joy is in you. You just got to get it up. It's kind of like when I drive home, I park my car in the garage. My car is in the garage. But as long as it's parked in the garage, I'm going nowhere. As long as my car is parked in the garage, it's a beautiful car. It's a nice car. It's a wonderful car. It'll take me anywhere. But 
as long as it sits in my garage, I'm going home. God has given us joy. It's inside, but as long as you keep it parked inside and you're not utilizing it, you're not going anywhere with it. So what do you do? I better fill my life up with all the stuff over here. And then when it's all said and done, I'm like, none of that really makes me happy. It's kind of like the roller coasters we're around. The first time you ride it, it's exhilarating. On the fourth, fifth time, you say, okay, it's kind of getting boring because you're a different ride. It's kind of like buying a brand new car. Oh, that sensation, you feel a wonderful smell and everything. But about the 10th came in on it, you say, boy, I kind of love this car. <laughs> you see, it, it doesn't satisfy. It just made me happy in the moment. It doesn't give me the joy that lasts. You see, it comes from the Spirit of God. It comes from the Spirit of God. Well, when do you get it? I've already answered this too. You get it like King David is singing in the, the Psalm 30 or 52 or 51 here. He says, King David sings us the answer when he says, when do you get it? The joy of your salvation. The moment you get the salvation of God, the moment you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, he puts joy in you. I remember sharing my faith with a man. We had a men's prayer breakfast when I was pastoring in Ohio. And, and Russell calls me all the time. Uh, after that prayer breakfast, he said, hey, I, I need to talk to you because we had a challenge and a devotional given. He said, I don't know the salvation you guys are talking about, but I want it. I said, okay, come out of my office. I said, we're going to wait for a break. I went through the Bible, shared with him how he could know Jesus as a Savior. He prayed and accepted Jesus. And, and the guy that was sitting in this chair, honestly, goodness, is exactly what he got, did when, when he was done. He said, amen. He goes, yes, yes, this is wonderful. This is great. He, I thought, oh my goodness. I got a picture of got my hands. You know, he was just jumping up and down. And, and you know where he landed? He landed over here in this newborn chair. That's where he landed. He had such joy. Oh my gosh, you know what it was? His sins were forgiven. He had been washed clean. His guilty conscience was gone. He had peace with God. And this guy, he was, he was so bubbling over, he went home, drug his wife to church. You gotta get what I got. You gotta get what I got. He drug his kids to church. You gotta get what I got. You gotta get what I got. This guy, I talked to him about a week ago. He's as on fire like that day, only he's over here now. He's been taken on staff at the church where he's at in charge of winning people in Christ. Is that, is that exciting? He, he, he never stepped back this way. Well, maybe, I don't know. I wasn't there all the years. But he, he, he's just so excited. It's the joy of salvation. God puts that in you the moment you're saved. Paul agrees with this. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. So if you, if you accepted Jesus, you got the Spirit of Christ. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you know you're over in this chair. There should be joy in the salvation of the Lord. You guys say, what chair am I in? That was all my introduction. Whew. Sorry about that. This might be a long sermon. <laughs> there are four joyful principles I want to share today. Number one, you can find joy. I don't care who you are here today. You can find joy. You can find joy. How? You got to move from this chair to this chair. You got to. You got to give up yourself and accept Jesus as your Savior. That's what you got to do. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust. In Him. Trust is the Old Testament word for faith or synonymous. You can't have real faith if you're not trusting in Him. If, you, if you're really trusting in Him, you really have faith. You believe. And what it's saying is, you find, and if you're a Christian, you found joy in the moment you, you accepted Christ as Savior and became a baby Christian. <clears throat> the question is, what have you done with it? Which way have you gone? Which way have you gone? You can find joy. My second point is this second principle. That you can lose your joy. You can lose your joy. David says, restore the joy. Now you don't you only restore something that you've lost. Right? So David, who had the joy of the Lord, lost it. He lost the joy. 
And in the song, he's praying and he's singing this prayer and he's saying, Lord, restore the joy of your salvation because I've lost it. You know how you lose it? When you go back this way. When you start living for yourself. When you start living horizontally and you skip living vertically. When you say, Lord, I think I can handle this on my own. Just take a day off. <laughs> I got this, God. I'm going to do it my way. Okay. Soon we find that I'm not happy. I may be happy for a moment because the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. It's always momentary, short-lived. He says here, truth is you can lose your joy. You can lose it. There's actually no lasting joy in the Lord when you're over in this area. The lasting joy is over there. Over here is only short-lived. Pleasure for a season. You can lose your joy, and I, I want to show you from King David's experience. So let's consider King David, whom God himself called a man after my own heart. He, he was a spiritual man. My goodness, just read all the songs he's written. You know he was a spiritual guy. Uh, he, he longs for the Lord. But in 1 Samuel chapters 13 and 14, there was an incident in his life that robbed him of his joy. He was uh, just coasting along, cruising along with life, and, and, and it's, it says he was enjoying the joy of his salvation uh, until one day in 2 Samuel chapter 11, it says in verse, in verse 2, the first verse says, when the kings go off to war, David stayed home. Part of this is always, yeah, I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time. I shouldn't put my, set myself up to lose my joy. One evening, David got up from his bed, walking around on the roof of his palace. From the rooftop, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. Couldn't sleep. You ever had a sleepless night? Yeah. I have a sleepless night. I get up. That's what he did. He got up. He's out on the rooftop. He's looking down. And what's he see? It was an innocent look. He sees a Bathsheba bathing. The woman was very beautiful. Next thing I notice in the text, it says, and David sent someone to find her. You see, that innocent look turned into an internal desire. Find out about her. He finds out this. The man said, isn't that Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Mm, desire gets the best of him. He gives in to the desire. Then David said, messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. And it's a look mixed with an internal desire. Giving into that internal desire. The woman can see that word to David saying, I'm pregnant. And now he's guilty. And something's going to happen. I can't, I can't hide this. But he decides he's going to try to cover it up. He sends a note to Joab, who's the commander of his armies, uh, to get her husband, Uriah. Send him back home, and uh, when he gets home, uh, he, he says, Hey, you know, how's the battle going? Hey, why don't you spend the night with your wife? So uh, he sends out Uriah, who's from the battlefront, to sleep with your wife, but he doesn't. He sleeps at the gates. It's reported he didn't sleep with his wife. And so he throws a bag and tries to get him drunk, send him back home the next night. Wants to sleep with his wife so he can make him think that the child is his child. And, and so, no, no, he says, I, I could never, I could, my fellow, my, he's a patriot. He says, my fellow soldiers are out there on the battle line. How could I go home and, and sleep with my wife when, when the men that I'm bonded to in, in battle are, are putting their lives on the line? And he slept at the gate in protection, in protection of the king. So David takes Breaks it over to Joab. It says, Joab, send Uriah to the fiercest part of the battle so that he might be slain. Ties that up, seals it with the king's seal, gives it to, to Uriah. Uriah goes back to the battlefield, gives it to jo, Joab, the commander. He reads it and says, get up to battle. He's killed in battle. Joab sends a message back to David. David's got, oh, he's covered this up. 
He's covering up. Some of the king's men died. Moreover, your servant Uriah, the Hittite, is dead. Mission accomplished. He tries to cover it up. The only problem is, <clears throat> David knows what the Lord knows. The Lord knows what's going on here. David writes about Psalm 32. He said, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. I got anybody else out there full covered up? God knows I know. He says this, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. It was like God's hand was pushing him right into the ground. You ever been depressed? His bones are wasting away. The hand of God is pushing him into the ground. My strength was sapped from me like, like a hot summer day. And he, said, and he says other things in other, in other psalms about this experience. And he said, I was depressed. See what happened? It's a slippery slope. Take a diet, for example. You're on a diet. You've been foregoing sweets and desserts. You're at a party and there they are, all the sweets and desserts. And you have an innocent look, eternal desire. Next thing you know, you've got it in your hands. <laughs> you're casing it. You've got your phone out and you're figuring out how many calories are in this thing. How many bites did I have? Is it, you can't fit on it. You eat more than you say, but you're calculating, you know, and you, you and then you try to cover it up with, I can rationalize, well, tomorrow I won't. I'll start this all over tomorrow. But deep down inside, you're depressed. Because you blew it. And you know it. I, I could do it again with a car. Oh, there's, man, you don't need a car, but man, you can see the neighbor's got a brand new car, you got a new car, you're looking at your mind like it's pretty old. And, and next thing you know, you're, you're in a car dealership. Wow, this is a pretty nice car. And next thing you know, you give into it, you buy the car, and then after, like I said earlier, the tenth payment, this the newness is wore off. The guilt is set in. I couldn't afford it. Didn't really need it, and I got it. Now, I, what can I do to cover this up? I, 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 I'm trying to figure out ways I can cover what I've done. And next thing you know, I'm just plain depressed. The principle's the same. You see, you can lose your joy. You lose your joy when you're focused on all the stuff here. You lose your joy when you're not focused here. You lose your joy. The nice thing is, you can regain your joy. Isn't that wonderful? You can regain your joy. King David is depressed. Now, it gets a little worse before it gets better. King David living for a full year and finally God summons a prophet Nathan. Nathan is to go to the king and expose the king and Nathan is a preacher. And that's the preacher's job. So if you hear sometimes you feel like, man, the preacher's stepping all over my toes. Well, I'm doing my job. <laughs> but I'm just the messenger. <laughs> this is the message. You got it? He goes into David. He knows David was a shepherd. He says, hey, I'm going to tell you what's going on. He says, there's a, there's a, a rich man. There's a lot of sheep. Large farm. His next door neighbor's just got one, one little sheep. It's a little blue lamb, and he, he's raised it as, as a kid. He carried his bosom, slept with his kids. It's like a daughter to him. And the rich man, traveling from a far country, a friend traveling from a far country, came and he wanted to provide a meal for him. So he took the poor man's sheep, his little lamb, and, and he killed it. And, and he prepared it as a meal for the, for the rich man. David got infuriated. Infuri infuri he was angry. And he says, that man should die. <laughs> he goes, and he should pay the man four times over for what he has done. And then Nathan points his finger and says, you are the man. You are the man. You took Uriah's wife. You slew his husband, her husband. You're the man. Whoa, it's exposed now when he thought he'd covered up. It's out. Everybody knows. It's at that point. That David makes a confession. I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord, and 
you forgave the guilt of my sin. Wow. Do you notice that? Acknowledge, didn't cover it up any longer, confess. What I think is amazing here is this part. My sin, my iniquity, my transgressions. Here's a typical confession. Lord, forgive me for all the things I've done wrong. Amen. Where's the genuineness, the repentance in that? The one thing here he calls sin. My sin. The word sin means failure to hit the target. Lord, my failure. I failed you, God. My iniquity means my lawlessness. I disregarded your law. Two of your commandments in the Big Ten. Adultery and not coveting my neighbor's wife. I disregarded your law. I'm lawless. And my transgression is rebellion. I rebelled against God Almighty. He said, God, I'm acknowledging I, I'm in a terrible fix here. It's a point where he confesses it. He's naming it. He's identifying it. He's remorseful over it. And that's where Psalm 51 comes in. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Grant me a willing spirit. Turn me around, Lord. I'm over here. God, turn me around. Give me a willing spirit to get back here. He goes on, take not your Holy Spirit away from me. He goes, he, he's very re remorseful. And he's serious with God about this. He does a genuine repentance. He turns from it. When David was uh, accusing in the, the story that Nathan made about him, that David burned with anger against the man. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Not only do we repent, but in some things, like he couldn't bring Uriah back to life. But in some things, you got to repay. You got to set it right. You got to fix it. You don't just confess it. You got to fix it. You don't just confess it. You got to repent, turn from it. And when you do that, he says here. Blessed is man whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Because when we do that, you're restored to the joy of salvation. My final point here is that you can sustain the joy. Because that's what he said. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. What? To sustain me in my joy? I want, I want to live a life. I want a joyful life. He said, you can that you will sustain me. The New Testament says this. So I say, live by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit. And the Spirit, what is contrary to the, Holy, uh, to, to the sinful nature. These two are in conflict with one another so that you do what you don't want to do. But if you walk by the Spirit... You got a vertical relationship always with God. You're keeping connected. You're not going there. You're always focused this way. Focus this way. How do we do all this? Like Joseph. I'm going to tell you one more story about Joseph in Genesis. Pharaoh asked, Can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of the gods? Joseph's the guy over here, man. He's got the Spirit of God in him. Joseph, though, as a teenage guy, was sold into slavery. He was bought by a guy by the name of Potiphar. And Potiphar uh, found that everything Joseph was doing, because he's a spiritual guy, God was blessing. And so he put him in charge of everything, uh, everything of his whole household. His master's wife looked at him. The verse says that he was a handsome guy. Young, handsome guy. Potiphar's wife looks at him, notices Joseph, and said, come to bed with me. Leave you where you're at. Come on over here. All horizontal. Come to bed with me. His answer was, My master has withheld nothing except you. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Look, see, everything to him is vertical. But this would be a wicked thing going over here working on horizontal level. How could I? How could I do that wicked thing? Sin against God. See, when you keep your eyes focused vertically, you don't mind up being 
over here in the happiness chair that is short lived. One day, all the other servants were out of the house. She caught his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. He left his cloak in her hands and he ran out. Not only did he have the right attitude, I'm not going to say it's God, he had the right action. I am fleeing from this chair that is all horizontal. Now you think, wow, you were working great. Well, you know what happens if you read your Bible. As soon as her husband came home, said, look, I got the cloak of the guy that tried to rape me, accused him of rape. Okay. He gets him thrown into, into prison. It just so happens to be in the prison because uh, he's one of the uh, people in the court of Pharaoh. He's in Pharaoh's prison. And so and in prison, there's uh, two guys that have dreams. If he interprets them, they turn out in such a way that just as he interpreted them, that as a result of that, years later, the king had a terrible dream and no one could interpret it. The guy said, oh, I remember this guy in prison. He knows how to interpret dreams. It brings before the king. And the king, Pharaoh, says, tell me the answer. He does. He said, whoa. He said, you're the only one who knows my dream and the interpretation of it. I'm going to make you second to myself in all the land. Sometimes it even gets worse before it gets better. But you know what? He never lost his joy. Because joy is not dependent on the circumstances. Joy is always dependent on relationship with God. Always, always. You see, it's like this. You're cruising along with joy. You can take the slippery slope, or you can have the right attitude. I'm not going to sit against God. And do the right thing. You're going to flee. Doesn't always mean things will get better. Ultimately, they will, because I read the end of the book. We get to the end of the Bible, we win. It doesn't get any better than that. But he had the right attitude, right action. He kept his joy, not depression. The question I have is, can this be said of you? Joseph, can anyone find anyone like you? One in whom is the spirit of God. Hey, do the people you work with say, the spirit of God is in you? Do the people in your family say, whoa, the spirit of God is in him, her? Do the people you hang out with, do they know you say, hey, the Spirit of God is in you? Do your teachers, your students, do they say the Spirit of God is in you? Pharaoh recognized the Spirit of God was in Joseph. See, I, I ask all of this because I'm actually, I really want the question is, are you settling for happiness when you can actually have joy? Are you settling for the temporary when you can have the perpetual? It's reward now and also reward later. When Jesus tells a parable about the talents that he gave one to one, two to another, uh, five to another, the man that had one hit it didn't do anything. He lived like the world. He lost his joy. He lost. He does because this is what the text. His Lord said to the one who who had done really well, "Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you a ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord." I get rewarded with joy now and later for all eternity. I get rewarded, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy. I call this emotional pleasure that arises above your circumstances. It's called happiness on steroids. <laughs> Why would you settle for that when well, you can have this? By keeping a vertical connection with the true living God. The Holy Spirit produces this joy when we walk with the Spirit, keeping that vertical connection. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we are about to partake of the Lord's Supper, and the Lord's Supper is a celebration of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. The cup represents his blood, the bread represents his body, that he might give to us eternal life 
not just in the future, but the quality of it now. Joy. Some of us have been on a slippery slope. Some of us are trying to straddle two chairs. We got one foot in the world, one foot with you. We wonder why we're not happy. May we be so bold as David, as we prepare for the Lord's Supper, to confess our sins like he did. We get downright specific. And then, Lord, ask for a willing spirit not to return to it. May we not take this table lightly. May we prepare our hearts before you so that we are truly in fellowship with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Father in heaven, you put joy in our hearts. It's there. Help us to get it out by focusing on you and not on the horizontal plane. Lord, in a few moments, we'll all be gathering again at the big boy. Bless the food to us. Nourish and strengthen us. Bless our fellowship around the table. For those who cannot join us or are heading in other directions, may your good hand be upon them today. Bring us again together to worship you next Sunday in an old-fashioned service, with an old-fashioned picnic and an old-fashioned hymn sing. May we all invite someone to join us, we pray. In Jesus' name, 